Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Whoops. Is that, was that my mistake? That's okay. So we can go ahead and get started. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Should we That's give them a few minutes if, they, uh, if there are any stragglers? Well, let's go ahead and get started and we'll be recording the webinar. So Dr. Bernstein, okay. if you'd like to go ahead and begin. Sure. Well, thank you all for attending and good afternoon. My name is Mike Burns and I'm a member of the ACRO New Practitioner Committee, leading the Education and Webinar Subcommittee. So once again, I wanted to thank you for joining us for our first webinar of 2018. I have the extreme pleasure of introducing one of my close friends, Dr. Nin Ori, who will be presenting today for the webinar. Dr. Ori is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. His research interests have focused on treatment of locally advanced lung cancer, SBRT for liver cancer and metastases, as well as pioneering the field of activity monitoring and radiation oncology, which will be the focus today. In this webinar, Dr. Ori will be discussing how monitoring a patient's activity through wearable technology impacts treatment and also may predict for oncologic outcomes. A few housekeeping notes, all attendees are muted. However, if you do have questions, please enter them in the question box and time permitting, we will answer them at the end of the webinar. So thank you once again all for attending. And with that, I turn the floor over to you, Dr. Ori. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, it's my pleasure to be uh, speaking today. Um, and I guess I'll get started. Uh, so, uh, still on the first, okay. Uh, so I have one uh, relatively recent disclosure. Uh, I'm a consultant for Merck that is not relevant to the uh, present talk. Uh, just to outline what I'll be talking about, we'll talk uh, focusing on, of course, activity me uh, monitoring first uh, in general in the field of medicine, and then drilling down more specifically to oncology, and then we'll talk about uh, what's been going on in radiation oncology, uh, most of which um, what I'll present will be data from my institution, and then we'll talk about future directions. Uh, so, pedometers uh, were actually popularized in the 1960s in Japan, and uh, they were called Manpo Kai, which literally means a 10,000 steps meter, uh, because uh, people in Japan at the time thought that walking 10,000 steps a day uh, was a key to healthful living, uh, and that actually has sort of been maintained even in, in present day. Uh, but now, of course, as you're all aware, uh, wearables have exploded on the market. Uh, if you look on... Uh, Amazon, I did this a couple of nights ago. There were about 6,000 different results. Uh, granted, some of them are just the same thing in different colors, but um, the point remains, there's tons of these devices out there. They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and of course, as we all know, uh, most smartphones now uh, can be used as pedometers and keep track of steps as well as other things like uh, step climbing. Right, and so here are just a little figure of the top five smartphones uh, in the uh, towards the end of 2017, uh, the last two, number four and number five, are actually uh, Chinese smartphones, uh, which also have this capability. Uh, so I alluded to this already. Uh, you know, many of you will have heard that about 10,000 steps a day is a good goal. Um, uh, one group uh, has studied this and uh, suggested some categories. Uh, these are admittedly arbitrary, talking about less than 5,000 being sedentary, 5,000 to 7,500 being low active, going up to 10,000 being somewhat active, above 10,000 is active, and uh, 12.5 thousand or more being highly active. Um, the authors did acknowledge that this, you know, is not really based on evidence, uh, or solid evidence at least, and certain groups such as uh, children will have very high, even higher step counts, and uh, some groups such as elderly uh, subjects and patients uh, with chronic diseases will have much lower step counts. So uh, these categories, I think, are, uh, you know, just a very general uh, guideline, but certainly can be drilled down upon more. Uh, and in thinking about what we can do as oncologists and radiation oncologists with this kind of data, um, the first question uh, that came to mind is sort of, you know, what can we do with these step counts? Uh, are they to be treated as a vital sign, telling us what patients are doing? Uh, can they perhaps be used as an intervention? Can we leverage these uh, devices to make patients more active and will that improve outcomes? Uh, or in some settings, maybe a step count as a measure of quality of life or 
uh, patient physical status, it can be used as an endpoint for uh, looking at different treatments or different symptom mitigation strategies. Uh, so looking through the literature, um, I'll highlight some uh, relatively high-profile publications uh, using wearable devices. Uh, here's a large study uh, for patients with uh, impaired glucose tolerance or prediabetes, where thousands of subjects uh, were given pedometers just for one week at baseline and then again for a week a year later. Uh, and they found that baseline activity as well as a change in activity over the year uh, were both inversely associated with cardiovascular event risk. So. Uh, just one week of data at uh, one time point or two time points can be a powerful predictor of the likelihood of uh, something like a heart attack happening in an at-risk population. Uh, so I would argue that here the step counts are serving as some kind of health status or vital sign. A similar finding in a different population. These are uh, patients who are deemed to be at risk for knee arthritis. Again, they were given um, a, um, you know, a pedometer for or an accelerometer in this case for just one week. And the primary outcome was developing a disability two years later. And it was found that spending greater amount of time in activities was inversely associated with the incidence of disability. Interestingly, they found that from a statistical standpoint, uh, doing light activities for a longer time was actually more protective than doing vigorous activities for a shorter time. Um, so just being generally active without necessarily doing high impact things uh, was protective against uh, disability. Uh, so here is a, a very uh, well done meta-analysis uh, from JAMA from a few years back. This was looking at studies testing uh, daily step count goals uh, using pedometers. And uh, there was a smattering of trials, uh, some randomized trials involving a daily step count goal. Uh, some uh, were blinded, some were not, and some were single arm observational studies. And they had a few interesting findings. Um, here's a scatter plot of uh, the change in activity in terms of steps per day versus the baseline activity. Uh, they found overall um, across this variety of studies, which was a variety of patient populations or even some healthy subjects, uh, users did increase their activity by about 25% over baseline. Um, but really that change was uh, largely restricted to studies in which subjects were given a specific step count goal, such as walk 10,000 steps a day. Um, so that I think is informative that pedometers perhaps can be used to motivate increased activity, but there's certain uh, it needs to be done correctly. Uh, people who use pedometers did have a slight decrease in their BMI, uh, particularly uh, patients who had older age and had a specific step out count goal. And in the studies uh, that looked at blood pressure, uh, blood pressure actually was reduced uh, in pedometer users. Uh, this leads to uh, another study that uh, got a lot of press last year, or now two years ago, I guess, um, looking at the idea of, of using a uh, wearable device uh, to enact some long-term weight loss. And this was uh, got a lot of press because it was actually a negative study. Both groups, uh, uh, some had dietary uh, modifications recommended, and uh, some also had wearable devices. Uh, and both groups had improvements in body composition, fitness, activity, uh, but there was no difference between groups, meaning the uh, uh, the activity monitors did not add anything. Uh, but if you look deeper down into the details in the paper, uh, you know, the patient population was uh, certainly relatively young uh, compared to patients we may be concerned with. But more importantly, uh, the device was not very convenient. It was a strap you can see that goes around the arm. And subjects admitted that on days when they were wearing it, they only wore it for an average of about four hours. Uh, and the reasons uh, often were that the band is uncomfortable or it's visible and uh, could not be concealed other than the clothing. So I'd argue that this, uh, while a negative study, was uh, perhaps a negative study because the intervention of having this wearable device was was flawed. And, and today's technology is a lot more user-friendly and could probably be a lot more effective. Uh, and finally, um, one study looking at step counts as an endpoint. So this is a study for patients uh, with heart failure, looking at the idea of using a nitrate uh, to increase physical activity. And the hypothesis was giving a nitrate would improve physical activity. Uh, but surprisingly, they found that actually the nitrate decreased physical activity uh, measured by an accelerometer. So this is an example of using a wearable device as a, uh, to provide data for a primary endpoint. In this case, they happen to have a surprising uh, finding. I suspect if we uh, did the same thing with a lot of cancer studies, uh, we could also get some surprising results. So uh, moving on to the realm of cancer, 
uh, we uh, there is a sort of an explosion of um, studies using wearable devices in oncology. Uh, I looked this up a couple months ago and found 35 studies in PubMed. Now there are 40 studies, and this is just studies using the uh, Fitbit, which is of course just one specific brand. If you include other device uh, brands, you get even more studies. Uh, and there was this nice uh, review article about this in JNCI uh, last fall. So what's the purpose? Why would we want to study activity monitoring in cancer care? Uh, at what points could it be helpful? What benefits could we uh, provide to our patients? So uh, I broke this down into potential gains that could be seen before treatment, during treatment, and after treatment. Uh, before treatment, I, I would argue, or hypothesize that perhaps step counts could be an improved version of performance status that might help us pick patients who are really fit for aggressive combined modality therapy and perhaps identify other patients for whom uh, less aggressive therapies should be considered. Uh, during treatment, and this is where we focus most of our efforts at Montefiore so far, uh, I think, and I think we're finding uh, or proving that step counts can really improve our evaluation of patients as they go through treatment, as they experience treatment toxicity. Um, perhaps we can use the step count data to provide enhanced supportive care for patients with declining activity levels, uh, all with the goal of preventing hospitalizations, preventing ER visits, improving quality of life. And in the survivorship setting or after treatment, um, these devices are easy enough to wear long term. I think, uh, and I've seen in practice now, patients when they have recurrence, often uh, the symptoms that are uh, arising from that recurrence can also can be quantified uh, quite easily with uh, step counts. Similarly, patients who are having late toxicity, such as radiation pneumonitis after lung treatment, uh, that usually bears out in the step count data as well. And even for patients who are doing fine without any toxicity and uh, you know, destined to live without evidence of disease, um, then perhaps uh, wearables could be used to promote healthful lifestyle in the survivorship period, uh, which is also, I think, of, of value. So uh, any or all of these uh, could reasonably be expected to improve clinical outcomes uh, one could also expect that if you reduce things like hospitalizations and ER visits, uh, you would reduce healthcare expenditures. All of this, if you just you know do the simple ratio, will improve cancer care quality um, and lead to improved cancer care value, which are all uh, priorities of of all clinicians and all health systems. Uh, so there have been uh, some studies in uh, cancer patients, although generally they focused on cancer survivors. Um, so here's one review paper uh, from an active group uh, in this area. They found uh, over 80 studies, but they found the vast majority were in breast cancer survivors. Um, it was a smattering of, of studies. Many of them uh, performed just after treatment. Some of them did include the during treatment period. Uh, most of the studies were sort of moderate in size uh, with an average sample size of 83. Uh, some of them, uh, the interventions are sort of displayed here in the table. Uh, and, you know, I think this is encouraging that there's a lot of work going on in this area and that most of these studies were older and we're using older devices like accelerometers, uh, which measure uh, sort of gravitational forces instead of actual step counts. Uh, typically, those are more expensive, uh, certainly not waterproof, uh, certainly need to be charged frequently. Uh, so now today that we have more user-friendly technology that is essentially ubiquitous, I think we can uh, sort of move things uh, to a new era. Uh, some of this is already going on. This is not something that, uh, you know, that I'm the first to come up with. And actually, uh, many of you are aware, there's actually a large uh, randomized cooperative group study going on uh, with a planned sample size of over 3,000 patients. But like many of the studies in the previous uh, review, this is a study for breast cancer survivors. It's being led by Alliance, uh, and it's looking at a weight loss intervention uh, following completion of treatment for localized uh, breast cancer. The hypothesis is that by promoting weight loss, you could reduce the recurrent re recurrence risk. Um, and part of the weight loss intervention is that patients will intermittently uh, be wearing a Fitbit and be given a program to try and uh, increase their daily step counts. Uh, so as I mentioned, we at Montefiore uh, started a series of trials and uh, we thought to really uh, get a start, we would focus on the period during treatment uh, when patients are coming in every day, uh, we're seeing them uh, relatively often and can collect the data pretty frequently. Uh, this is a time when, particularly in our patient population, we see a lot of patients with acute toxicities leading to hospitalizations. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about uh, for the next few slides. 
Uh, so one study that was uh, performed in Pittsburgh, uh, kind of the same time I had the idea of uh, using wearable devices in my patients, uh, uh, Dr. Champ at Pittsburgh uh, told me he was doing something similar in his clinic. Uh, so the first paper from that experience was an observational study of 10 uh, patients with breast cancer or DCIS who were treated uh, with hypofractionated postoperative radiotherapy. Uh, and you can see the step counts here. Uh, uh, in the graph, uh, they're smooth uh, using a moving average for clarity. Uh, but typically, you can see if you look at the actual lines, it seems like most patients' activity levels are pretty constant. Um, but if you do the statistical analyses, they actually did decrease slightly uh, with an average of about 50 steps per day during treatment. Now, these were breast cancer patients. None of them had serious toxicities. None of them were hospitalized. None of them ended up in the ER. Uh, but this at least was the first step in showing the feasibility of uh, collecting this data in a clinic setting. Uh, this study was used uh, using a MISFIT device, um, which is uh, pretty good. It's, it's inexpensive, it's uh, waterproof, and has a good battery life. Uh, now moving on to what we've been doing at Montefiore, we've been uh, went and gone with a different company. We've been using Garmin devices, uh, pictured on the bottom right. We've been using uh, Garmin VivoFit. Uh, we chose this because it also is waterproof. It has a battery life of one year. Um, using watch battery, it does not require charging at all. Uh, it can hold three weeks of uh, step count data, can be synced wirelessly, wirelessly using uh, Bluetooth to any mobile device uh, or computer. And also uh, there's a, a companion device you can install uh, called the Vivo Hub, which we've now put in each of our clinic waiting rooms. So anytime a patient walks by, the data is already automatically grabbed and downloaded um, and sent to the Garmin website. Uh, so we can go through uh, the studies we've had uh, in our institution, uh, the first one, uh, which is number one in this table, uh, was our pilot study. Uh, we chose to focus on patients who were getting concurrent chemo radiotherapy because we thought that's where we would uh, expect to see the most toxicities and the most uh, hospitalizations. Uh, so this was really just a feasibility to study to see if we could uh, collect the data. At the same time, we were also giving patients weekly quality of life assessments with the EORTC QLQC30 uh, to see if we could find any associations. Uh, the next study uh, after that was uh, looking at using that step data to perhaps uh, provide additional supportive care uh, for patients who have low step counts to see if that could help prevent hospitalizations. And that study recently completed. And the third study that's ongoing is uh, flipping things around a little bit using uh, these pedometers as part of an intervention, uh, where for patients on the experimental arm, we ask them to walk more and to try to achieve the daily step count goal that's displayed on their device. Uh, to see if, by encouraging patients to walk more, we could uh, reduce systemic inflammation, improve quality of life, uh, reduce treatment toxicities. Uh, so what I thought I would do is just summarize some of the, uh, you know, salient and uh, some some unexpected findings uh, from our first uh, set of patients. So this is our first 120 patients over the first over the three studies. A pretty fair distribution between the pilot study, the uh, symptom prevention study, and then our, our walking randomized trial. Uh, you can see the diagnoses. Uh, you know, the first few studies were just uh, limited to head and neck, lung, and GI cancers. Now for our walking study, which is going to be a much larger study with about 170 patients, now we've opened it up to other cancers treated with definitive chemo RT or postoperative chemo RT, things like uh, GBMs, cervical cancer. Uh, so there's a few other cancers uh, included by now. Um, you can see most patients in this cohort were being treated with definitive therapy. Most patients are getting weekly chemotherapy. And uh, the distribution of performance status, most patients PS0 to 1, um, with about 10% being given a performance status of 2. Uh, so on the right, I put a histogram of the baseline daily step counts. So this is the average steps per day before starting chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And the first uh, thing you can see clearly is that a, a small minority of our patients are achieving that um, that generic goal of 10,000 steps a day. Uh, in total, uh, just about 10% of our patients. Uh, most patients are more in the range of 5,000 steps, um, and that's before starting any treatment. So clearly, um, if we expect any toxicities at all, it's hard to imagine that our patients will be uh, reaching 10,000 steps a day uh, during treatment. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the real values here is uh, that this technology gives us a lot more information uh, than what we could gather through any kind of survey. And if you look at the literature, 
uh, for any, you know, oncologic or non-oncologic patient population. The most often or the most commonly used questionnaire for this is uh, the Godin Leisure Time Exercise Questionnaire, uh, which asks questions about uh, activities, strenuous exercise, moderate exercise, or mild exercise patients performed over the past week. Um, now, I know, you know, in the Bronx, we have a somewhat different patient population than uh, some of you may have, but I think it's very rare for me to have a patient uh, who's been playing any baseball recently or tennis or playing any hockey or a lot of the things on this uh, on this chart. So I think, uh, I, you know, I haven't used this, ex this questionnaire routinely, but I suspect most of my patients would score zero. So um, in our patient population, I think it's far better to have the objective uh, information uh, from the pedometers. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that we were using a moving average when we made some of these graphs uh, to display uh, the data in a way that's interpretable. Uh, one question that arose is how much data do you need to really get a sense of how active a patient is? Some of the initial, some of the studies I showed earlier with diabetic patients and patients at risk for arthritis um, had patients wear pedometers for a week. Um, in general, the literature supports uh, that you just need about four to five days of step data to get a, a meaningful average, and you know, that's certainly what we found in our patients. Uh, uh, this box plot on the right. Um, shows that depending on how many days of step data you gather, uh, you can get pretty close to having a good estimate of the average. Once you get out to about four or five, the, uh, the error bars get pretty narrow, so you could uh, reliably estimate a patient's uh, baseline step average within a few thousand. Uh, another thing that was striking uh, as we collect more and more of this, of this data, but uh, you know, became uh, clear almost immediately, was that uh, step data is really not fully explained by any other parameters or any other measures that we're observing in the clinic. Uh, certainly older patients tend to be less active, and that's shown on the uh, scatter plot on the left, uh, which is pretreatment daily step average versus age. Uh, you know, we don't have any 90-year-olds who are doing 10,000 or even 5,000 steps a day. Uh, so certainly there's a correlation that's statistically significant, but if you look at the R-squared value, that indicates that only about 10% of the variation in step counts across patients is explained for by age. Uh, similarly, on the right, you know, we're not seeing any patients in clinic who, to whom we're ascribing a performance status of two who are walking 10,000 steps, uh, but a few of them are up to 5,000 steps. And uh, even more strikingly, there are some patients who we give a PS of zero who are walking only a, a few thousand or even a few hundred steps. So again, it's, uh, you know, if you, the correlation would be statistically significant, but again, the uh, variance only about 10% of the variance in step counts around across patients is explained by performance status. And this is consistent with uh, what's out there. There's uh, one interesting paper uh, comparing ECOG performance status uh, to physical activity. And this is an older study that was using uh, accelerometers, which give uh, sort of duration of moderate uh, or activity being out of bed. Uh, they had 100 patients with a variety of solid tumors who were accelerometers. And they did find a, a significant but again, weak correlation between physical activity, which was measured objectively using accelerometers, and performance status. And crucially, they found that 80% of patients whose clinicians gave uh, provided an ECOG score of zero to one spent more than one half of the waking hours resting, which if you look it up is the actual textbook definition of performance status three. Uh, now, performance status was defined in ECOG before they had this technology, but if you go by the book, 80% of patients who we think are ECOG zero to one are actually ECOG three, uh, which I think goes to show how performance status is really uh, very much a subjective measure and, and can be approved upon with technology. Uh, so the third aspect of, uh, you know, third thing that we could collect, although we don't always collect it routinely for all of our patients, is quality of life. Uh, so we've been using this QLQ C30 uh, which has 30 different questions. If you take the average score and scale it out of 100 uh, and compare that to step counts, which we did on the left, again, uh, patients who have really bad quality of life scores tend to walk a little bit less, but it's a very weak correlation with R squared value of only 0.02. And uh, even more so, if you look specifically at the subset of questions in the QLQC30 that deal with physical function, uh, and in, in the, you know, even less than 1% of the variance of step counts is explained by uh, by that physical functioning score. Uh, so whatever, for whatever reason, at least in our patient population, quality of life uh, is 
very loosely correlated with step counts. Uh, so here's the uh, results from our pilot study, which is the um, first uh, study we've published so far. Uh, this was last year in the Red Journal. Uh, we accrued uh, 38 uh, eligible patients uh, from June to December in, of 2015. And uh, for those of you out there who are, uh, you know, thinking of projects uh, to do, if you'll note, this was all done within six months. So, of course, the eligibility was broad. It was anyone with head and neck, lung, or GI cancers getting concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Um, but it is possible to get a lot of patients and get a lot of data uh, using modern technology relatively quickly. Uh, so we were successful in uh, demonstrating feasibility. We got step data for 94% of patients' treatment courses. Um, somewhat surprisingly, uh, a lot of patients ended up in the hospital uh, due to acute toxicities, either during treatment or shortly afterwards, uh, over one-third. On the right, that's demonstrated graphically. Uh, step counts are shown. Each line is a different patient. And then the triangles are the days of patients' hospitalizations. Um, it's actually their first hospitalization. Some patients bounce in and out of the hospital afterwards uh, again and again. Uh, so you can see clearly uh, the triangles are clustered towards the bottom. Uh, and if you look carefully at the lines, you'll see uh, even when the, um, even more so the, the arrows are, uh, tend to occur in patients who have declining step counts. Uh, so from a, uh, the modeling we did indicated there was a 38% reduction in the risk of hospitalization for every 1,000 steps uh, using a Cox model. Uh, highly statistically significant, um, and also the change in step counts over time uh, was significant when we added that to the model. Uh, so here for the 14 patients who ended up in the hospital, here's what happened to them and who they were. Uh, you can see it's a variety of reasons to end up in the hospital, often things like fatigue, weight loss, uh, dehydration, uh, infections. Some things, like the first patient uh, having a stroke uh, a few days in, into treatment was probably unavoidable. But a lot of other things like pain, uh, weight loss, uh, dehydration could have been managed, uh, we would hope, uh, if we were more aggressive with our uh, supportive care management in the outpatient setting. Uh, so that's where we immediately saw an opportunity that if we had this step data and were following it and knew what to look for, uh, perhaps we could intervene in time to uh, prevent these hospitalizations. <clears throat> Another interesting thing we found uh, in this pilot study uh, was that many of our patients are extremely inactive on weekends. Uh, this can be explained it's sort of on weekdays, the patients at least have to, are supposed to get out of bed and come to our clinic to get radiation. So we're sort of forcing them to have some activity. Uh, but many patients would be essentially bed-bound on the weekends uh, between their weekday treatments. Uh, and we found that uh, these weekend step counts were particularly good at predicting hospitalizations over the next week. Uh, so we Based on this, hypothesize that the weekend step counts really represent the patient's true functional status. Uh, and that's what we chose to focus on in our uh, predictive models going forward. <clears throat> uh, so using that, we generated uh, something called an activity score. Uh, the activity score was born out of some uh, somewhat complicated uh, logistic regression uh, models, but you now we boiled it down to this relatively simple model. Uh, so this is um, what I call my Monday plot. So every circle represents data that you could collect from a patient on a Monday. Uh, on the x-axis is the average step count over the past weekend, over the immediate past two days. And that's plotted on a, uh, a sort of logarithmic scale, uh, just to make it uh, clear. On the y-axis is how much that weekend average over the previous two days um, was different compared to the previous weekend. So if you had a patient who was walking 4,000 steps a day, one weekend, and then the following weekend decline to 2,000 steps a day, uh, they would get a negative 2,000 on the y-axis and a 2,000 on the x-axis. Now, if you add those two numbers together, that's what I call our activity score. And the black line uh, that's curved going across the screen uh, is when that sum is 1,600, which turned out to be our best predictor of patients' risk of being hospitalized within the next calendar week. So we're looking at predictors of you know, really short-term hospitalization, that if you see a patient on Monday, you can hopefully identify patients who are at risk for hospitalization uh, in that calendar week. And we found that this works pretty well. Uh, the odds ratio is uh, 15, which is highly significant. If you turn out to appear to be, have uh, an activity score above 1,600, your chance of ending up in the hospital is only about 1 in 100 over the next week. 
Uh, but if your activity score was low, the chance of ending up in the hospital is over 10%, uh, which we think is certainly not a perfect, you know, not a perfect ter uh, tool in terms of specificity, but certainly seems to be sensitive and uh, identifying patients who are at high risk. Uh, so how does our activity score uh, do versus other measures? Now, I've already told you these measures are not the same information, but can we also predict hospitalization just by eyeballing the patient or doing something else? Uh, so on the left is a, a scatter plot of activity score versus most recent performance status. Again, activity score is measured every Monday. Performance status is measured when you do your weekly checkups. Uh, and, you, and the red circles are patients that, who ended up in the hospital. Uh, the black circles are patients who did not. Uh, so clearly we can see patients can end up in the hospital even if we think the PS is zero or one. Um, so activity score is a clear winner in terms of predicting hospitalization against performance status. Similarly on the right, we have quality of life on the x-axis and the y-axis is activity score. Uh, and again, all the red circles are clustered below the dotted line. So meaning if your activity score is less than 1600, uh, you're at risk for hospitalization, uh, even if your quality of life scores are pretty good. And so that led us to our second study. Uh, this is uh, completed but not fully uh, analyzed uh, or published yet. Uh, this is, we call it RAMPART, real-time activity monitoring to prevent admissions during radiotherapy. The idea here was to kind of do exactly what we uh, proposed based on that previous plot, that every Monday we would collect the step data or look at the step data, calculate the activity score, and then for patients who had activity scores below that cutoff of 1,600, we would simply schedule that patient instead of a uh, for a checkup once that week, uh, they would get a, a status check or on treatment visit with a radiation oncologist or nurse practitioner every day that week. Uh, the supportive care measures could, that were provided were totally up to the clinicians, but the idea was just us recognizing, listen, this patient may be in trouble, let's see them frequently and make sure all their needs are addressed. Uh, the primary endpoint was hospitalization during chemo radiotherapy. Um, Unfortunately, it turned out that it's a single arm study with a plan to, uh, you know, loosely compare the results to our first study. Uh, we ended up with a somewhat different patient mix uh, in the second study compared to the first study. So we had a similar, similar number of hospitalizations overall. Uh, but if you look at specific subgroups, um, and here's one, uh, one of those analyses, patients with uh, decent performance status and either head and neck or lung cancer, uh, there was at least a trend suggesting that uh, we had fewer hospitalizations uh, in, this, in the follow-up study. Uh, now that's led us to design uh, and propose a potential cooperative group study. Uh, this is something we're hoping to open up uh, through the NRG this year. Uh, this would be a cancer care delivery research study run through the uh, NCORP which, uh, sites, which is sort of the uh, coalition of minority and underserved uh, sites uh, within NRG. Uh, and here's the schema for that uh, for that study. Uh, so the idea would be to to roll out the same concept that we did in our uh, in our second study on a national level uh, with a small uh, run-in component, which would be essentially a pilot study. So each institution participating would first enroll five patients getting concurrent chemo RT for head and neck or lung cancer, uh, just to make sure they could use the devices, knew how to collect the data, um, know how to register the patient. And then at that point, uh, institutions would move on to the randomized portion. Uh, we'd employ a, a cluster randomization on the clinic level. Uh, patients on the uh, control arm would just get routine care uh, with no activity monitoring devices. Patients on the experimental arm would get a Garmin device, uh, and the clinicians would be asked to look at the activity scores every Monday. And just like we did, we would ask them to see the patients more frequently or uh, consider some kind of enhanced supportive care for patients who had uh, low activity scores. Uh, the primary endpoint here is a combination of any or any of these three adverse clinical events, treatment interruption, ER visit, or hospitalization. Uh, we hypothesized that would happen to about 40% of subjects on the control arm, and we hope to reduce that to 25% on the experimental arm. Uh, so this will, um, again, still being uh, reviewed, but hopefully would uh, be accepted and, and get going sometime later this year. Uh, now we're going into our third study at Montefiore. Uh, this is our randomized study, uh, a simple walking program to enhance concurrent chemo radiotherapy delivery. Uh, for this, we got some funding from the Radiation Oncology Institute, 
Uh, the concept is based on um, a lot of published preclinical and some clinical data, uh, including a small study uh, from breast cancer patients who did uh, resistance exercise training during radiotherapy. Uh, being more active seems to be, have some anti-inflammatory effects, and perhaps by promoting activity in patients, we could reduce systemic inflammation, uh, reduce treatment toxicity, and uh, improve the rates of completing the planned treatment, which of course should eventually uh, uh, improve cure rates. Uh, so for this study, we're taking 166 subjects from a variety of solid tumors, uh, patients getting concurrent chemo RT. Uh, they're being, everyone gets a device, they're randomized to usual care versus being instructed to meet the daily step count goal, which is displayed on the device. And that's a dynamic uh, number based on recent step counts over the past few days. Now, the key objectives are to demonstrate that patients on the experimental arm have less systemic inflammation, less toxicity uh, based on uh, CTC as well as uh, quality of life scores, uh, fewer treatment breaks, and fewer hospitalizations. Uh, so here's a little bit of early data. We've accru accrued about uh, 60 patients so far. Uh, for inflammation, we have some plans uh, with some uh, blood work collecting to do things like IL-6. Uh, for now, we're also sending off CRP levels, which is, of course, a measure of general information. Uh, we did find so far uh, that at baseline, uh, pretreatment CRP seems to be associated with activity, uh, where subjects with a high daily step count seem to have less inflammation. Uh, and already we're seeing in this, even though it's still early in the study, um, that patients who have high CRP indicating they have uh, a lot of systemic inflammation are far more likely to end up hospitalized during the treatment course uh, when the kappa Meyer curves for that are shown on the right. We don't have any data yet, I should say, uh, regarding uh, the efficacy of the intervention. Um, we're seeing some difficulty in convincing patients to walk more in the experimental arm. So, um, you know, we're uh, the current workflow is we're having our study coordinators uh, gently uh, encourage the patients each time they're seen to try and be more active if they're on the experimental arm. Uh, but moving forward, um, you know, what else can we do with this? And we've sort of talked about, again, focusing on what we can do for our patients during treatment and patients who are getting curative therapy. I do believe activity monitoring has uh, a lot of potential in patients with more advanced disease. Uh, one may argue perhaps even uh, more potential. Uh, many of you will be aware of this study from JAMA. This is from Ethan Bosch's uh, group when he was in Memorial. Uh, looking at a simple patient monitoring tool uh, for uh, for patients getting chemotherapy for advanced malignancies. Uh, so this intervention was quite simple. There was a computerized um, tool. It was basically an email that went out to patients on the experimental arm once a week uh, saying, hey, how are you feeling? Uh, score your toxicities. And patients who had a high score for any of the, uh, the questions um, that an alert went to uh, someone from the study team who would reach out to the patient and say, hey, what's going on? So really, it's quite simple. The intervention here is a weekly email. And in the first report, uh, the investigators reported that that simple intervention uh, reduced ER visits and prolonged the duration of patients staying on uh, their systemic therapy. In an update uh, with overall survival data in JAMA last year, uh, they reported an improvement in overall survival just with a simple email tool uh, with improvement in uh, median survival uh, by about six months, which is actually incredible if you think about it. Uh, and an older study uh, from New England Journal, uh, one also many of you guys will be aware of, this is from uh, Dr. Temple uh, in Boston, uh, looking at an early palliative care intervention for patients with metastatic uh, lung cancer, basically saying if we just involve the palliative care service early, what happens, and they did report improved quality of life, um, all kinds of other improved outcomes from a patient standpoint, but amazingly, there was actually improved overall survival just from having the conversation about palliative care early on. Um, so what does all this mean? I think it means that we unfortunately do not do a perfect job of assessing our patients, um, specifically, particularly our patients with advanced disease, and perhaps that's another place where uh, technology could be leveraged to help us take better care of patients. Uh, so this is a schema for our fourth study that's opening up. Um, it was just uh, with the IRB uh, a couple of weeks ago and should be open uh, relatively soon. Uh, this is a study uh, that we're doing through some funding from New York State, looking at patients getting systemic therapy for advanced cancers. Um, we're looking at patients who are ambulatory, 
uh, in, in a few different disease settings, uh, metastatic head and neck cancer, metastatic lung cancer, getting second line or beyond therapy, uh, metastatic gastric, esophageal, pancreatic, or hepatobiliac cancer, or colorectal cancer being treated with second line therapy or beyond. So these are patients who are at risk um, at some point of disease progression, certainly at risk for treatment, toxicity, hospitalizations, all that bad stuff. And really, we're just testing to see, can we take the same workflow we've implemented in our radiation oncology clinic and move that to our colleagues with medical oncology? Uh, and the idea is that we would uh, try and have the medical oncologist provided with the step data at the time of each checkup. Typically, they'll see the patients every two to three weeks. And we're just asking the medical oncologist be able to review step data over the past few weeks and past few months at each visit. Uh, so objectives, of course, we want to demonstrate the feasibility of doing this, which I think uh, should hopefully be a slam dunk. Uh, but we're also looking to gather a lot of preliminary data, and we're expecting to find that patients with declining step counts and who are still receiving active therapy will be at risk for having intravenous therapy within just a few weeks of death. Uh, they'll be at risk for receiving fancy radiation within a few weeks of death. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be at risk for being entered into hospice way too late, within just a few days of death, uh, as well as other adverse events like emergency room visits and hospital admissions. Uh, so with this preliminary data, we would uh, hope to move relatively quickly uh, to a randomized trial where we could uh, demonstrate the benefits of incorporating activity data into the care of patients with uh, more advanced cancer. So. Moving, uh, moving forward, future directions. This is my, my uh, last slide. So, uh, you know, I, I truly believe after, uh, you know, a couple of years of doing these kind of trials um, myself, but even more so by seeing the amazing results uh, from other interventions in other centers uh, using things like emails, uh, that anything that we can do to enhance the patient monitoring, enhance the supportive care we provide, uh, will dramatically improve outcomes in cancer patients. And that's during treatment, after treatment, uh, whenever. I think, unfortunately, we're all busy. Our patients may, may sometimes not want to tell us exactly everything that's going on. We may not be asking the right questions. Anything we can do to make our evaluation of patients more rigorous uh, can truly improve outcomes in a, in a powerful and perhaps unexpected way. Uh, I think wearable devices uh, can be key in expanding these programs. Uh, you know, not all of our patients use emails. Uh, you know, that we can have these devices that are expensive, user-friendly, provide such large volumes of objective and dynamic data. Uh, as the technology improves, we'll be able to, uh, you know, to monitor patients from anywhere. They don't even need to come to our clinic. Uh, these are truly scalable workflows. Uh, you know, something that works in a small population can be rolled out to a much larger uh, health system for not much money at all. And, if, and, you know, this is just step counts we've been looking at, but there's a lot more information that is, is out there. We can look at sleep data. We can look at... Um, step climbing, we can look at heart rate, we can look at blood pressure. All these things are increasingly being incorporated into devices that are becoming more and more user-friendly and affordable. Uh, so I think it'll be important for us to develop workflows to bring this, this health tech data uh, into our clinic, into our electronic medical record, and sort of into our minds as to when a patient comes in and the chief complaint is, I used to walk 10,000 steps a day, now I'm only doing 500. Um, we should know you know, know what that means and know how scary that is. Uh, so that's the end of the uh, slides I'd uh, prepared. I'd be happy to uh, open the floor up uh, to any questions, comments, concerns. Is anyone still listening? Okay, anyone, if you guys have questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box uh, and I'll be happy to read them out loud. So we'll give people a few moments to a few minutes to add in or type out their questions. Um,
Okay, it looks like we have one. Um, have you evaluated or are you considering evaluating technologies which incorporate heart rate monitoring? Yeah, certainly. That's a very good question, and uh, certainly that's in the plans. Um, for our initial studies, we chose to use a relatively simple device because, um, the, you know, a couple of reasons. One being it waterproof, uh, so we can just tell patients keep it on, you know, for throughout the treatment course. Uh, two, uh, the battery life is uh, is key. I think, it, particularly in my patient population, many of my patients are not going to charge the devices. They're not going to uh, do much at all actively. So. Currently, uh, the devices that do heart rate monitoring generally have battery life, you know, on the order of one week. Uh, uh, and certainly in some patient populations, it would be reasonable to expect your patient to charge the device uh, when needed. Um, but as the devices get better and uh, perhaps maybe more selectively, we could offer this to patients who seem willing and able to charge the devices. I'm uh, certainly planning to use more advanced devices to, to see what are the implications of other metrics such as heart rate and also heart rate variability. Uh, there's a lot of data that patients who have diminished heart rate variability uh, seem to have, uh, you know, poor outcomes, uh, you know, from sepsis to all kinds of other things. Um, so pr probably in the oncology world, we can uh, learn a lot from heart rate variability as well. Okay. And um, do you have any ideas on how to incorporate the data of current users of wearable devices into the clinic workflow? So there are people looking at this, and there's, um, you know, there are software solutions out there. I think one key is, um, you know, with regards to putting it in the electronic medical record, uh, I think most health, most health systems are, um, you know, initially a little bit wary about that because they're not sure if it's really health information, if it's any, you know, perhaps some liability for not acting appropriately. Uh, for me, what I've started doing often when I'm seeing patients in follow-up is I'll just put a little line in there, like the patient continues to wear a, a fitness tracker and is averaging approximately 5,000 steps a day. Uh, just as something to be in the note, and the next time I see the patient, I can, you know, refer to that or some other clinicians could refer to that and uh, maybe just sort of spread the word a little by little that this is some uh, in information we are collecting. Uh, but on a broader scale, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's it will be key, and it, uh, it's just a matter of time and getting uh, the EMRs and the other clinicians on board. Um, there are, uh, you know, companies that aggregate the data for you. Uh, there are within the device companies, uh, they all have, Sort of social media or, or, or groups you can join, and um, you know I could envision having a you know a group on the internet where you have cancer patients or cancer survivors sharing data with one another um, and motivating each other. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, at least in my health system, it's not they're not quite ready to put the data in the EMR. Okay, and. Have you noticed any differences in activity or hospitalizations with relation to length of radiation course? So breast four weeks versus head and neck seven weeks? So um, we have, so with breast, uh, we have not included breast. So for our studies, we've only done patients with concurrent chemo RT. So we have not had any breast cancer patients. Um, and generally during, you know, if you're just getting breast radiation, um, particularly short course, you know, hospitalization due to treatment toxicity would be ex extremely unusual. Uh, but within the cancers, we have been focusing on uh, certainly head and neck and lung patients tend to be hospitalized more than lower GI patients. Now, is that because, you know, like a rectal patient gets five and a half weeks and a head and neck patient gets seven weeks? I mean, really, it's a different disease site, so there's lots of reasons. And, um, you know, it's not surprising that there's more toxicity. Um, with head and neck radiation than, than pelvic radiation for rectal cancer. Um, in general, we have you know pretty standard algorithms for each disease site, so it's hard to tease out the if a difference is related to the actual site you're treating or the treatment length. Now we do have a randomized study going on for lung cancer right now, comparing uh, six weeks of chemo RT to a hypofractionated accelerated course of uh, four weeks using a dose painting technique, and uh, Patients on that study are also being enrolled on our activity monitoring study. So we will have some data uh, in the future about that. Okay. And how do you change your supportive measures based on decreasing number of steps 
um, per day or per week? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and uh, in truth, I think it's, you know, every patient is different and I don't think there's a specific algorithm um, that you can apply blindly. I think really the key is uh, communication. I think we all know what to do. We know if a patient's in pain, they need analgesics. If a patient is having trouble with weight loss and dehydration, they need mucositis cocktail, IV fluids, uh, you know, analgesics, whatever it is. I think we have sometimes a feeding tube. I think we all have the same sort of bag of tricks. Uh, I think sometimes it's a matter of implementing uh, one or more of those tricks in a timely fashion. Um, some anecdotes uh, from what I've seen. Um, I had a gastric patient once where uh, they were getting post-operative chemo RT. The patient kind of said they were feeling fine. They looked okay. Um, the med onc note said they were going to continue with the weekly uh, chemo, but then the patient's daily step counts were only about 500. It turns out he was in terrible shape and uh, basically bed bound. And he ended up in the hospital uh, very quickly. And, uh, you know, maybe next time we have that kind of patient, uh, I could go to the medical oncologist and say, hey, listen, you sure you want to continue with this, uh, you know, with this chemo? The patient's actually in really terrible shape, or maybe you should talk to the patient some more. Um, other anecdotes, we've had lots of times where we have patients in pain, we prescribe narcotics, but the patient doesn't pick it up because of it not being in stock in the pharmacy or cost issues, or the patient just uh, wasn't feeling well and didn't go pick up the medicine. And the next thing you know, 24 hours later, they're in the ER for pain. Uh, when really, you know, we saw the patient on a Monday, we thought we addressed the pain, uh, but we didn't realize they were still in pain on Tuesday. And perhaps that's another way uh, step data could help us you know, monitor patients more continuously. Uh, so in short, I think the specific interventions uh, will vary. It's really just an alarm sign that something needs to be done. Okay, and is there any plan to compare or combine step count with calorie restriction while on RT, ongoing trials, or only preclinical data showing benefit? So that's something, um, I know there's, you know, active studies going on about caloric restriction or ketogenic diets. Um, as I think it would be certainly, you know, these patients monitoring the step counts is so easy. I don't see why not. And I think uh, if, if you're doing a study of caloric restriction and can demonstrate you can restrict calories without reducing activity, um, you know, I think that would be an important finding. Uh, as far as... Um, you know, I think achieving uh, caloric restriction in patients who are sick and uh, achieving, you know, keto, uh, ketosis in, in sick patients uh, can be difficult. Uh, so I, I would I would say combining that with a, a, another intervention, like an exercise intervention, could be even more uh, difficult. Not to say it can't be done, but it would really require a motivated patient um, with some very specific instructions. Uh, but I think that's a setting uh, where the step counts can be used more as a vital sign uh, to demonstrate that patients are, are still doing well and feeling relatively well as they're undergoing these dietary changes. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay. Uh, I think that go ahead, um, that concludes our webinar. So I want to thank everyone for attending. And Dr. Ori, thank you so much for presenting. It was very informative. Uh, and I'm sure this is going to be really helpful information for everyone. So uh, the webinar was recorded and it will be posted on the members only section of the website. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact the ACRO um, office and we'll be happy to address them as we can. So thank you again. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. We appreciate your presentation and uh, introducing this exciting new area of oncology research for us. And uh, keep your eye out for future emails for future webinars, which will probably be uh, next month. And hope to all see you at the national, or uh, excuse me, annual meeting in early February. Thank you again. Thank you guys for listening. And, or and thank you to the organizers.